welcome back to part two. I see most of you have made it from part one if you've been joining us this morning so far. We have an exciting lineup and I'm gonna get right to it. First, I just wanted to mention, I love pins. Uh, Rachel Lasala here for those that are just joining us as well. I'm a big pin person. I wore my rainbow pin for our first section because I believe in allyship and rainbows usually I, uh, are a symbol of allyship. And as we talked about advocacy for women in coaching, um, as well as diversity fellowship programming, it felt really uh, appropriate to put that pin on. But now I am going to switch over to my Gotham, New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC pin, because we have uh, an exciting member of that squad jumping in and joining us in this next session. But I will let our panel host, uh, Andrea Ekla, joining us from BN Sports, Head of Partnerships uh, and Sponsorships there, come onto the stage, introduce herself, and then introduce her fellow panelists. Andrea, please start that camera and let's get you on stage to kick off our realities in management panel, looking at the NWSL and the USL specifically. Hi, everyone. Oh, brilliant. I can see everyone now. Um, sorry, I wasn't sure if I'm going to talk to myself. I'm new to the platform as well. But hi, everyone, um, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in for what is going to be an incredible half an hour. My name is Andre Ekblad, as um, Rachel has kindly introduced me as well. I head up partnerships in content strategy and media rights acquisitions for B Media Group. And I'm really excited to be hosting this um, conversation with three incredible women uh, working in powerful positions in, in soccer. On this panel, we're going to talk about the realities of management in the NWSL and the USL. And let me do first a quick intro to our guest today and then dive right into the conversation about the business of soccer. Um, and at the end, I hope that we will have some time to um, answer some of your questions as well. So first of all, Lizzie Seedhouse, SVP of Digital Emerging Technology and Strategy at the USL. Lisa Levine, Head of General Counsel at the NWSL. And Elise Lahieu, General Manager of Gotham FC. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, <laughs> really Hello. good to have you here in our virtual uh, circle and also hi everyone around the world um, tuning in for this. Uh, my question, first question is uh, to all of you and it is about, I would like to hear more about uh, your own story. How did you get to your role? And if you could tell us also a bit more about your career pathways. Lizzie, let's start with you. Thanks Andrea. Thanks to We've got some echo. We're good. Okay. Hey, thanks, Andrew, and thanks to Women in Soccer for, for having me today. Super excited to connect with Elise, uh, Elise and Lisa as well. Uh, my career path really started uh, about 10 years ago when I took a job for a startup marketing company that, that worked uh, in internet marketing and, and content generation. I did that for five years, uh, got really burnt out and tired of the startup lifestyle and, and quit, uh, and then started looking for a new job. And, and accidentally ended up working for the USL. I didn't know they were in Tampa. Um, I was looking for a job in, in technology and, and working on websites because that's really uh, you know, my main passion. Uh, but I, I kind of just fell into it and they, they hired me as a, a website manager on day one. And then um, the next day they gave me an office and called me a director. And, and since then it's been great. Um, really accelerated my career there. Um, it's, it's only a, a 10 year old, now a 10 year old company, so that it's still like a startup in a lot of ways and lots of opportunities to grow. Um, and now I'm the, I'm the senior vice president and I love it there. Thank you. Um, Lisa, um, let's go to you next. Sure, thank you. And uh, again, good day everybody. I don't know where everyone is. And also thank you as well to Women in Soccer for inviting me here to participate in this. Um, at the risk of, uh, of telling a long, boring story, I'll go back a little bit further with my career path. Uh, when I was graduating from college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I was thinking about going to law school, but I wasn't really sure. And my parents gave me some really good advice at that point, and they told me not to do it if I wasn't committed to it, and I wasn't at that point. Uh, probably much to their chagrin, I wound up moving back into their house while I was trying to figure out what to do next and started playing a lot of tennis. Um, which is 
interesting given where I wound up landing, but I became really, really involved in, uh, in tennis, both in playing and started reading a lot of like the business side of tennis. And that was what really sparked my interest in sports was I wanted to somehow be a part of, of athletics, of sports in that way. Um, that was what prompted me to uh, eventually go to law school because I knew my playing would never get me into tennis, but I was hoping to try to get in, you know, kind of a backdoor on the business side. Um, going through law school and trying to get internships and clerkships in various sports-related entities really threw a lot of water on uh, on that passion for me because I found it just very, very difficult to do. And that, well, you know what, I'll just have a career as a litigator and wound up taking a job in uh, Cleveland, working at a law firm there uh, and doing a lot of uh, employment work, litigation, some IP. And uh, just so happened to be at a bar one night, as you know, one does in Cleveland, and met somebody who worked for a sports representation agency in their legal department. And we became really good friends. Um, I had let her know that she had my dream job at, at that point. We were still really good friends after that. Um, and uh, she let me know when there was an opening at the, uh, at the company. The company was IMG that happened to be headquartered in Cleveland. And that was my uh, entree into, into the world of sports. Worked at IMG for a number of years, eventually uh, moved over to US soccer as the general counsel there. Was lucky enough to be at US soccer when my league and, and Elisa's league, the uh, National Women's Soccer League was formed and was um, in the position to be on the team that helped actually create the league, which was, you know, it was fabulous. I, I've never looked back on tennis. I've always kind of moved ahead with soccer and been really, really happy with the way it turned out. But um, that uh, the creation of the league eventually led to my moving over to NWSL full time. And so I've been general counsel of NWSL now since 2017. And uh, we're in our, our ninth year, our ninth season and going strong. a really fascinating story and I'm sure everyone is googling now their you know, target organizations nearby bars uh, as well yeah, nearby yeah. bars yeah the bar is the key <laughs> exactly um thanks for sharing all of that uh, Elise what about you yeah Lisa Cleveland's the home of chili spaghetti isn't it isn't that uh I'm sure it has a picture uh, I think of Cincinnati more for skyline oh, that's right yeah that's skyline right. but man that stuff's good yeah <laughs> Same state. Well, we, uh, okay, I, I was I was near. Well, we didn't make this easy. Lisa, Lizzie, and Elise um, maybe could have chosen folks with some uh, more disparate names here. But um, glad to be on today. Thanks, to women in soccer, for hosting this. And um, you know, my my story. I always knew I wanted to be a GM. To be honest, I think I just chose what I thought was the highest title, and I had no idea what it meant um, after I got my master's degree. I, I had always loved women's basketball and. The WNBA had been around for a while. Um, women's soccer was just coming back. So this was in the early years when they were deciding to bring back WPS, um, the previous league um, before NWSL. So I went and um, applied for an internship. Even with a master's degree, I just wanted to get my foot in the door. Um, so one team uh, I was interviewed by an intern and the other team I was interviewed by the president and GM. So um, soccer, soccer became my pathway. Um, from that point on, and uh, I had told the then general manager, Marsha McDermott, that I wanted her job, which was probably a little bold for an intern, but she was cool with it. And we're, we're still friends today. Um, so she's been a great mentor to me. Um, after my internship, I uh, became a ticket salesperson, which I think is an important part of my story because there isn't, uh, I think, a, a quite linear pathway to being a GM. A lot of people ask, how do you become a GM? Well, I don't really know. All I know is my own pathway, which was to try to learn as many different positions as possible so that I could understand the whole organization. So starting in ticket sales laid a really great foundation for me and speaking to fans and interacting with fans and being able to relate to them. From there, I moved into player services, operations, sponsorship. So really just trying to dabble my feet in as many areas as I can. But I like to tell the story of, uh, you know, starting in ticket sales, because I think a lot of people um, kind of have an allergy to that. Um, but it really laid the foundation for who I am as a GM now. And I think what really um, all of you have mentioned as well, the importance of the mentorship. And uh, that's also why I think it's uh, I'm super grateful and, and for, for all of you to sharing your uh, stories as well as for Women in Soccer to bring in this forum together. Because I think there's nothing more useful than for the audience to hear about these uh, stories and the, the power of, of mentorship. Um, 
Next, it would be great to hear more about your current roles. Um, so uh, let's dive a little bit into all of, all of your uh, areas of expertise and, and what you cover right now. Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Um, what do general councils do and what is your role in your organization? I'd love to hear more about that. And if you could describe to, your, to our audience as well uh, the different legal roles within um, the league or um, a sporting organization and what is a typical journey from graduating law school to the uh, general counsel? Sure. Um, I'm not sure there is a typical journey, but but we'll get to that. I'll, I'll kind of try to go in order and break down what you had asked, Andrea. Um, so what do general counsels do? Um, sadly, don't frequent bars as much as I used to way back when. Um, but I guess if you had to sum up what the position was, I would really say it's to minimize risk to the entity and to provide counsel to your internal clients. And that's kind of the overarching role of, uh, of the legal position of the general counsel role. You're a generalist, you know, as the title suggests, you know, you know, a little bit about a lot of things, usually, uh, hopefully, enough to know when to go seek expert help in, in certain areas, but also enough to, um, to actually provide value. I mean, that's what every, every legal role ought to be providing value to the entity in some way or another. Um, one of the main functions that I see of the role is to really provide support and counsel, and it winds up being business advice in the role like I said, any legal position in a company, you don't want to just say no to things. And it seems like there's a reputation with a lot of legal departments that lawyers are obstacles or roadblocks. And, you know, I work really hard to try to not be that way. I think that doesn't, uh, doesn't do any good for the entity. You want to find ways to keep moving on. So even if the answer to something is no, you know, you find a better way to repackage it, that it's not, no, you can't do this. It's, well, Let's see if there's another way that we can accomplish the same thing. There's, um, as to my role in our organization, um, any, if, if people are familiar with NWSL, like obviously I know Elise is familiar, but um, we've, uh, the, the office, the headquarters, the league staff um, has been typically very, very small. When it started out, I think there were three employees of the league and, and I was not one of them when it started out. But when I moved over full time to NWSL in 2017, at one point there were four employees, including myself, uh, at the lead staff. And um, what that means is you wear a lot of different hats. So I've been doing, I've done a lot of things that, you know, certainly law school doesn't prepare you for, like uh, tweeting out draft picks at our draft and moving boxes at uh, league events and writing press releases. So the role, this, the specific role is kind of going to depend on your entity and how well staffed you are. I'm very pleased to say that we're much better staffed now. We've got over 20 employees and um, you know, it, it's, it's great. Hopefully folks like Elise actually see that in things like response time and services that we're able to provide to our member clubs. Um, and I, I see you nodding, Elise. I'll certainly use that against, uh, against the club if I ever need to. But um, it's one of our functions is to provide these services to the clubs and to try to help make their day to day jobs easier. Um, typical things that I do in a day generally relate to governance. Um, that's been like a big focus governance in terms of uh, our governing documents, in terms of expansion. We've been, um, we've been very pleased to announce that, you know, we've got two expansion clubs participating in our competition this year. We've got two announced for next year. A lot of components go along with that. So there's been a lot of work related to that. Other typical attorney functions include things like um, uh, trying to police our intellectual property, uh, working with our competition uh, related side of the house to make sure that all of the rules are uniformly enforced, working on commercial agreements, working on broadcast agreements, working on license agreements, uh, just a lot of um, a lot of things that you would probably normally think of as typical attorney things. Uh, and then finally, as to uh, what a typical journey would be, again, I'm not really sure there there is one, 
uh, particularly if you're talking about in the world of sports, but as to um, working just in a general counsel's office, you know, I think a typical path is basically what I had done, which is working for a law firm for a couple of years, moving in house, being a associate counsel or corporate counsel, and then hopefully you just kind of uh, stick with it and develop your skill set, network a lot, and uh, find the right opportunity to become a GC somewhere. Brilliant. Um, Elise, let's go um, to you and talk a little bit about structures of club. Uh, I'd love to hear from you what it looks like um, and what the typical roles are. Again, we're using typical, but let's go as, as generic as, as we can go. Um, and any challenges around it, for example, like if we look at a structure of a men's versus a women's um, soccer club as well, we'd love to hear more around that for me. Yeah, cool. I'll try to keep all the questions organized in my head here. But um, Lisa, I think uh, a couple, one thing you forgot as part of your, your job and then the speed at which the league works is the fines go out really fast now. So um, Lisa forgot that one as part of her, her job description. Um, I, I'm kidding, Lisa. Purposeful omission. <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate you. Um, yeah, the, the cool thing about being a GM, as I'm, you know, I'm sure many women working in sports can say, is that the day to day is always different. So I see my role as um, kind of two verticals. So I really oversee um, really the whole club operations from a front office perspective. And then my other vertical is the technical side. I think in a probably normal world, these should be two different roles. Um, but for now, making it work. Um, and doing both. Um, I actually have a passion for the business side, believe it or not. I think a lot of people think the player side is really cool and that's fun and all, but you know, at some point I like to, to grow up and move on to the player side. As I like to say, it's just, um, you know, grown adults chasing a ball around a field. I say that nicely. Um, that's, that's cute and fun and building a roster is cool. Um, I love all that side of things, managing the tech staff. Um, but I have such a passion for business. And I think that if we don't get it right on the business side, our leagues won't exist. Um, so that's what's always driven me in particular in my role. So I get to oversee the front office um, and that's really everything from revenue functions. So our main, main revenue drivers are ticket sales, sponsorship, and then a little bit into merchandise, um, maybe youth camps and clinics, things of that nature. So overseeing all of that actually is what excites me, which I think surprises a lot of people. They probably think the player side is more interesting. Um, but I think starting as a player services rep when I was much younger and having to deal with the players on a day to day basis um, was always a, a challenge for me. Um, the great Cheryl Bailey, who used to be uh, GM of the women's national team, went on to be um, head of, of our league. I think at WPS it was. Um, she once told me best advice I ever got was that you just have to say no to the players. So um, sorry, players, but Cheryl gave me the best advice ever. So when they come to me, I just, I just say no. No, you can't get that. No, we can't have that. Um, but that's been good advice in my career from uh, from the player side. So, um, yeah, GM, a little bit different every day. It's why I love it. I might be on a sponsor call one minute, might be dealing with a player media thing the next. Um, so keeping it diverse and exciting every day is is what drives me. And, um, you know, that's why I love being a GM. Thank um Let's go to Lizzie, to you, uh, last but absolutely not least. Um, and want to hear more about you know thanks to technology and the way it's evolving and how we consume sports in general and soccer in more specifically there's so many new roles that are coming uh, up um, and a lot of them probably our audience don't even know about so I think it'd be really interesting for you to to go into those and what are those organizations um, can you give some examples and also some of those roles too so people could could take notes and maybe on the practical side as well if you could give an example on the type of projects that you're working with, um, as well yeah absolutely and so just a quick overview of my role is uh, at the usl i oversee all, all the technology uh, that our clubs use and we use a lot of centralized systems right so like one website platform that all the clubs can use right one mobile app provider that all the clubs can use Etc. So my job is to identify these new technologies and then uh, to, to piggyback off what Elise said, like make our clubs successful in business using these tools. So sell more tickets, get more youth camp registrations, sell more merchandise using all of our digital platforms, right? 
Uh, so that, that's where really my, my emphasis goes, but I also spend a lot of time working on sports betting. And so one of the, the bigger projects I'm working on right now is that intersection of, of technology and sports betting and, and how the league and clubs can kind of capitalize on that. And so there, there's just a ton of different roles in that space in terms of uh, you know, data scouts or uh, integrity training, right? And, and monitoring games with companies like Sport Radar or Genius Sports are really big players in the game, right? Uh, Stats Perform, these, these global companies that are really well established in Europe because sports betting has been a thing there for, for decades, right? But now it's starting to come into the US and you, you see like companies like DraftKings and FanDuel, casinos hiring now in sports and sports books positions because that's now going to be the the biggest wave and trend um you know other companies that are, are you know really just technology companies right that's where i focus but they they intersect into sports as our, our website partner sports engine uh they're based out of minneapolis and they have ten thousand plus websites across their network right and so there's you know, if you want to work in sports, there is everything at that that kind of size company, right? From project management to finance to, to legal to uh, software developers and coders, right? So there's this really great breadth where you, you know, we have employees in the USL that don't like sports that much, right? But they're a really great graphic artist, right? And so it's this really good opportunity for people to dive in and try a new industry, but not have to be, you know, an ex-player, right? Or have had this all this background, you know, interning or doing other jobs in sports, which is which is really cool. Um, one of the other projects we're working on right now is NFTs, right? And how we use these non-fungible, um, I'm gonna say it differently, non-fungible uh, tokens, right? To, to, to open up a new role, uh, opportunity for monetization and, and support our clubs. So you'll just see as technology changes, sport is gonna be re- very much on the coattails or at the forefront of these changes. And so there's a lot of new roles just always kind of popping up from a, from a day to day, to be honest, there's lots of new opportunities to get involved. Exciting stuff and I hope everyone's taking notes. Um, and I think conscious of um, running out of time, uh, we're already heading to the closing question, which I thought it would be uh, really interesting to hear from you. Um, again, you know, feel free to jump in uh, to tell us a little bit about your experience. But um, it's around leadership and challenges and learnings of the of the year that we've just had. Um, I'd like to hear from you on how you know COVID has um, impacted our lives personally as well as. Uh, you as a leader, um, and how did you navigate it both? And um, what have you learned? And do you see uh, leadership traits differently that you did before uh, the pandemic hit and now coming out of it as well? And can you tell us a little bit about uh, that or some personal stories on that? Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I unmuted, I guess, first. Um, so, and I'm not sure if this is directly addressing the question, Andrea, but like I said, I'll take a, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I mean, COVID obviously was very, very challenging for all sports entities, um, but with NWSL and hopefully the same with our clubs, uh, Elise, we, we rose to the challenge, I feel, last year. I mean, it was a really odd year. We really weren't sure what was going to come. We had a brand new commissioner who began in March, and then one of her first acts was to basically shut down the league two days later, and that's uh, you know quite an auspicious beginning. But it's um, you know it was certainly the right decision. Other sports leagues were also reacting to COVID in the same way. But what what we did was at the same time that we had shut down um, preseason training, which had just started at that point. We started working with a, a medical task force, which we convened just for that purpose, including you know, one physician from each of the clubs and started working on protocols with this great unknown, particularly last March, of you know, what could things look like to return to some kind of, not normalcy, but, but just to return to the pitch with COVID. So they started working on protocols right away. At the same time, we started working on what could that return even look like? You know, how could we possibly come back with all the unknowns with our priority always being, you know, player safety? We're not going to do anything that's going to be an unreasonable risk to players. Again, see that legal, that tie-in, the segue from minimizing risk to 
trying to um, make a safe return possible. Uh, so NWSL became the first uh, domestic team sport back into action last year. Certainly wasn't what we had set out to do, but you know it brought us a lot of attention, a lot of media attention. And I'm sure Elise would be able to talk about that more at the at the team level. But brought us a lot of um, increased um, appearance in various media outlets, uh, and you know it was wound up being in a way you know a good thing for the league because it we were able to capitalize on broadcast windows that were left open by there not being college football on Saturdays, for example. So it was really a, a great example of um, taking lemons and making some you know pretty good lemonade out of it. As to uh, like personal um, personal impacts. You know, our our league office was working from home. A lot of people continue to work from home on a, on a semi-regular basis. And, you know, I think what it did is it just showed the dedication of everyone, um, you know, within the league that we're, we're able to commit and still do what we need to do in order to get the job done. For me, it, it really made me appreciate my um, fifth graders' teachers more, having to deal with the barrage of questions that come in every day and really made me miss going into the office. Uh, not in a mean way, because I love being home and, and being around him, but, you know, there's only so many fractions you can divide. Yeah, happy to hop in. I think just to uh, piggyback Lisa's point, I mean, Lisa Baird came in as our commissioner and got handed a pandemic. That's a pretty tough thing to be handed on your, your first uh, foray into uh, commissioning. And she did a phenomenal job and obviously us being the first league back. But I think there's parts of that story that weren't um, focused on enough. Like the fact that the players were essentially told you're going to keep your paycheck for the year if you decide to sit out, if for any reason. And we don't need to know the reason why, whether it's your personal safety, family, mental health, whatever it is. If you decide you don't want to go to the bubble and you don't want to play, you're going to get paid for the full year. That's a really big deal, a huge deal. And I don't think that got enough attention. So Lisa really led the way um, on those efforts and, and certainly the whole of the league front office in guiding these great decisions overall in terms of last season. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on just briefly, and it's a little bit of a moment of vulnerability, but I went through hell last year just mentally. Um, going to be just lay it out there. Um, mentally, over the last year, whew, it was tough. It was tough going through the pandemic and as somebody that leads a team environment, I'm used to being around people all the time. I'm an introvert that needs to always be in a crowd. And I didn't have that anymore. I actually like working from home for three months without seeing anybody face to face and having to do everything digitally. It was really, really difficult and sort of a really emotional process for me. On the second part of that is that most of my staff is, is pretty young. They're millennials. I'm a, I guess I heard I'm called a geriatric millennial now, but I'm at the very top of that tier. But most of my staff is in their 20s. They're very young. They did not handle working from home and being alone well at all. And I also was not in a great mental position to be able to better guide them and to better understand their needs during that time. So if I have any sort of what I'd call learning experiences through all of that, that was the biggest one for me, was to understand that that was really, really difficult um, for a younger staff to navigate being home alone, still putting up with all of my demands, but having to do it like solitarily without the normal support system that they had. And, and we were getting together digitally every day, but it's not the same. Like there's something physical about being in front of somebody and having that kind of molecular level of connection with somebody that you just don't get through a screen. So I guess that's my, my moment of vulnerability to say that mentally it was a hard year. And I also just want to shout out, I only had a cat and unfortunately my cat passed away during the pandemic, which didn't help. But to anybody that had children, my goodness, I don't know. I don't know how you did it. I really don't. And I just want to commend any of the, the mothers or those in the room that have children, because um, I cannot imagine what that was like going through it. It was, it was certainly a, a really tough time emotionally to navigate all of it. Uh, jump in real quick uh, to, to pick back up what Elise said. I think uh, it, it was like a mentally tough year, right? Like for me as well, but then also my young staff. And I, it taught me from a leadership perspective just to continue to lead with with kindness and compassion and empathy, right? And um, I, I work at home with, with two kids and they were both under the age of five at the time. And it was the inmates running the asylum, to be honest. Uh, and so it just gave me this really great appreciation for, you know, there's so much more going on and so much more things important than work, um, you know, that people are dealing with, right? Being locked up at home or having sick family members you can't go visit, right? Like 
uh, we're all just human and, and trying to get by. So um, that was my big leadership moment or, or learning point is just be continue to be patient with people. It's unprecedented times. I think it still is, right? A lot of us still aren't back in the office. Um, and so it's still trying to navigate that. And I think when we go back to the office, um, it'll still be a transition and it'll be a challenge for people. So, you know, just try to be, be a good leader and be patient with people. I think those are great um, words to uh, and thoughts to close on, on empathy and kindness and humanity. Um, and just as a, as a as really, really, really closing, uh, just one sentence from all of you when we talk about, you know, how to, would you have an advice to our audience about how to take the first steps into management uh, as a second career? Because um, there'll be a lot of people who might want to transfer their skills do you have just just in one sentence um, a piece of advice? Network. But one word. I'll do better than one sentence. One word. I, I agree. There. Uh, I, I worked hard a lot, but the relationships and networking is what pushes you over the edge. So, yep, that would be my my. Uh... I guess my sentence would be foot in the door. Um, and I kind of look at my own career. Sometimes you, the pathway you take might, again, not be linear or most obvious. It might be a little bit peripheral to what you, your current job or what your previous career was to try to get to the career that you want to get to. So to me, it's about just getting your foot in the door and showing that you're, you know, a, a good team worker, a good, you know, player, um, hard worker, all of those things. As long as you can get in there and show your skill set, I think that gives you the best chance to, to move along. Sorry, I made that way longer than a sentence, but foot in the door. Could also just echo as partnerships person the, the power of networking and building relationships and you know get to know as many areas of the business as you can so there is nothing you know wasted information that you can get or, or connection so um i think that's all we have time for today really enjoyed it thank you so much for women in soccer for putting this together and all of you to sharing honestly your experiences and, and knowledge and insights and i hope to see you know uh, many of you from the audience as well in in the sport biz very soon andrea thank you so much elise lizzie Liz, lisa lizzie you're right elise we did make that quite uh quite tricky thank you so much for being here we're going to quickly transition to our next workshop with a really awesome rad human that we are so lucky to have the privilege with us christina uncle she is a football laws analyst she is a fifa referee she is a ussf referee she is also a you know business law attorney uh a laws analyst as well um and yeah you know, what can't christina do but i will ask elise lisa lizzie and andrea to turn their cameras and microphones off and we can Welcome Christina up to the stage now to kick us off in our workshop around in order to become a referee. What does that look like? I know I'm really stoked about this. <laughs> there we are. Let me go figure this camera will work here shortly. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for bringing me in. Um, thank you for those who will, may stay for this side of the presentation. Um, I'm particularly excited to present on this topic and was excited to be invited to this event. Um, one more importantly, because I think this is part of the world that everyone forgets about when it comes to uh, the game, essentially, the refereeing component of it and what that can mean uh, and how you can turn that into a job, right? So here we're focusing on how do we you know, pivot maybe from our playing days into turning into career, whether that's administration, um, as you saw there, whether that's digital, whether that's sales, whether it's marketing, et cetera, well, you can still stay on the pitch after your playing days. And I'm excited to kind of introduce that to you uh, and explain like how that possible. So I kind of want to start off with the, the topic of this is breaking into referee. Um, and not many people understand effectively that we are part of the game. We are part of effectively um, being that component of it. And I definitely want to go ahead and introduce you all to effectively the different paths and career paths that you can 
do with officiating. I know many, I was talking to uh, Jerry Smith uh, on Monday. I officiated the NCAA Division I Women's Championship. And prior to the match, you know, he he, he was kind enough to be uh, uh, to thank us for, you know, our services prior to stepping on the field, knowing that officiating is not easy. And it truly isn't easy, but it's incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Many of the things that we do here um, is effectively something that we're all passionate about, right? I always kind of joke that, you know, the sports world, uh, there's three things. You're either married into it uh, to get to the top. You're either born into it uh, or you just get incredibly lucky. So any of those who have not been married into sports, um, born into sports, uh, do what they said previously in the other one and get really, really lucky in the sense of hard work, networking, connecting. I love that. I know many of the people on this presentation staff um, who has been talking to you uh, for the fact that I'm not in the administration side and if I'm on the pitch. Um, but I met many of them through networking uh, and kind of getting affiliated with it. So, and I will tell you my story in the meantime. Perfect. All right, Rachel, that's going your way. Um, I do want to tell you my story here just briefly, because um, as Rachel's mentioned, this is actually not my full-time job. Um, I am a litigation attorney. I work in construction litigation and sports law, uh, and that's what I do for my daily living. Um, this is part of my passion, my hobby. Um, for many of you guys uh, who have played, I was playing collegiate D2 soccer at West Palm Beach and Palm Beach Atlantic University. And when I finished playing in December of 2008, there was no opportunity for me to continue playing soccer. There was no, uh, it was the gap between WPS and NWSL. So there was no opportunity for me to continue to keep playing. One thing that happened though, was that I was recognized early on from US soccer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly, but I was recognized early on as having the ability, because I was already official while I was 10, um, to be able to feel, read, see the game. As a player, many of us who've played the sport, right, we already know the game and there's a lot of things you can say from, uh, you know, training officials if you've already been in the game and you have a feel for it. Um, so, yeah, I started, I, I like to say I spent my entire 20s um, giving back to the game by being on the pitch. And I knew I would never get on the women's, uh, the U.S. women's national team that I was in the player of that caliber, but I knew that I could officiate the U.S. Women's National Team. So I, I tell you that story because it's one of those things where we have, um, I think Alyssa said it, she always wanted to be a general manager, um, but it's one of those things where it's always funny how something is, we have this path and we have this projection of what we thought we were going to do, and when that doesn't pertail, how do we pivot? For me, my pivot was officiating, and, and I was blessed to do so um, and break into officiating itself, and I want you guys to be able to break into officiating also. Um, so it doesn't show that on there, but no worries. I'll go through it here shortly on mine. So as I mentioned, we are truly part of the game um, between fans, referees, athletes, coaches. I always say there's four different parts of the soccer game itself, right? Those who are viewing, the stakeholders, the watchers, right? And we have the athletes and the coaches, obviously very critical to the game. And what's always forgotten is the referee. And the referee is incredibly important because our number one thing is the safety of the players. Uh, and more importantly, it's also to make sure we administer the game for truly the enjoyment of the fans. We keep the flow of the game going. We keep everyone safe. Um, and we ensure that the game is able to be viewed and watched um, and enjoyed in that component. So as us being one of the four pillars of an actual game, um, it's incredibly important to understand that there's another path and trajectory to be able to still be part of the match itself. And the one thing I want to introduce you to is the U.S. Soccer Referee Program. So we are a component. Um, Let's say we are a component of uh, U.S. soccer. Uh, we are um, part of the U.S. soccer program. We have our own official staff as well, too, with that. We have a head of a referee committee. And truly, we have a lot of members across. We have over 140,000 soccer referees in the United States. That sounds like a lot, but if you were listening to any of the previous uh, communications, if you were to ask Lizzie, if you were to ask anyone, there is so much that is going on with soccer from the number of games to the number of officials that we need. So when I talk about having an opportunity uh, as a soccer official here, not only in the United States, um, but, you know, internationally and professionally, the numbers just make sense. We keep adding more MLS teams. We keep adding more NWSL teams. We keep adding more USL teams. The numbers don't go any lower. And now with the, um, the addition of effectively, you know, technology and the refereeing side of it, 
you no longer are looking at four referees per game. We are now looking at six to seven referees per game with three of them being in the booth. And when I say the booth, VAR, video assistant referee, that kind of a thing. So if you're looking for an area that has opportunity, has growth, I'm telling you this is an area that has opportunities because we don't have the numbers. Over 140,000 officials sounds like a great number, but those are all referees starting from effectively the grassroots level and beyond. So um, if, yeah, Rachel, if you can switch it over real quick to the next slide. Perfect. So this is what I was talking about, referee program. The details are in there. If you really want to know, all you have to go to is U.S. Soccer Referee Program. This is the introductory, essentially. This is saying, hey, Referee 101, where do I need to do to get registered as a referee for what we call sanctioned leagues, sanctioned clubs? So those leagues I just talked about, NWSL, MLS, uh, your backyard, right, uh, when it comes to the youth. Um, and even uh, semi-competitive games, it's all amateurs. This is where you would go to get registered. Each state is specifically uh, administers its own registration. So there is a really helpful link where you can log into a U.S. Soccer Referee Program. You can learn who is what we call the State Referee Administrator, the SRA, to learn effectively who's the boss of that state, uh, what part of the chapter do you belong to, uh, how do you register as a referee? They changed the terminology recently to what they call grassroots referees, which is, you know, the entrance of refereeing. And as we kind of continue to progress, you'll go move up that ladder. So, if, Rachel, if you can move it one more for me. Thanks. This is kind of the stuff that you all see uh, for the most part. So we all know about the, the younger referees up and coming. And when I say younger is, you know, the, the level of play, right? Here's where I think a lot of people aspire to, especially when you come down and we talk about professional is what we call PRO, which is the Professional Referee Organization. This organization effectively hires us and its number one priority, um, and it's basically tasked with, it's fairly recent within the past 10 years. Um, I used to say, at least when it was the you know middle of my career, that you couldn't make refereeing a full-time career here in the United States. You just couldn't. Um, there wasn't enough money in it to be able to do so, right? And it's very selective. And, you know, if you have a bad game, you'd be out for three games, right? And then there goes your revenue stream. Um, now you can make refereeing a full-time career here at the highest levels uh, with a professional referee organization who their entire focus is to manage professional referees for the different leagues in the United States and Canada, obviously, specifically MLS, NWSL, USL, and NPSL. Um, this is the ones that everyone's kind of familiar with when you're watching these matches. Um, but these games here provide that higher level of play. Um, and this is where you kind of go when you start to grow and move up the ladder. So I kind of wanted to identify and distinguish U.S. soccer referee is responsible for all referees in the United States. Pro referees is responsible for those four managements and kind of going forward. Here's what everyone also, there's a third organization um, in the referee world. Um, and I haven't even, I just realized I didn't put NCAA in this, but FIFA uh, is kind of what I think everyone's familiar of feeling, hearing, seeing as a FIFA referee. I was a FIFA referee for seven years. These are the referees who represent their country. So I always take, try to take refereeing and put it into kind of a soccer perspective, right? So if we're looking at our U.S. women's national team, right, to get to the U.S. women's national team, you have to qualify and be selected. And there's only a certain amount of spots. There's a lot of players, a lot of good quality, um, but there's a select group of people that we have selected to basically represent the United States on the international side with FIFA. These are the referees who represent us at the World Cups, at the Club World Cups, um, at the CONCACAF, which is our region, the regional groups. And this is where you see, um, and these are the referees who have qualified. So we have said that these are what we consider the best of the best in our country who have not only gone to FIFA events leading into it, whether it's U17s, U20s, We've had to qualify for over four years. By the time you get to a World Cup, you typically have been a FIFA referee for four to eight years. So it is a path and it's a long path. Um, and I do like that recently in the past um, five years that they have removed um, effectively the component of an age limitation. Um, and we look now more towards fitness um, and the ability to kind of perceive those. So one thing to get you guys a bit excited about it um, is our recent milestones for women officials. I know that we talk about women in sports, women in soccer specifically. You know, 2019 was such a pivotal year with the U.S. Women's National Team and the FIFA Women's World Cup and just seeing that major movement. And we were all looking forward to that adrenaline in 2020 uh, and continuing to do that. And we all obviously know what happened. But I love to say that it didn't stop. There was nothing that could stop 
women from the soccer field, whether it's players or whether it's as a referee on the pitch, from continuing to hit those milestones. Uh, and I was just recently talking to my friend Tori, who uh, is the first women uh, official to ever referee a men's CONCACAF event last week. And she's like, oh my goodness, this is really taking off. Uh, and for those of us who've been in this for a long, long time, for reasons um, not PC, many of us couldn't get ourselves into a men's game, even though we qualified for different reasons. And now that those milestones that we're reaching um, are no longer really a major component. They have been eliminated. We have an open mindset. Um, those who are in, responsible for appointing the officials are no longer thinking archaic and are thinking just about quality. Um, so many of these milestones here, as you can kind of see, are women breaking into uh, Champions League, right? Huge. Um, Stephanie Frapper, all that she's been doing, right? Breaking into our own very own Catherine Nesbitt, um, first woman official in any of the major men, uh, men's sports in the United States, in the Northern, um, to be able to referee in the final of Major League Soccer. Um, and she's such an incredible person, too, so that always helps, right? <laughs> to be able to support these individuals. And Tori Penso, as I mentioned, First female official in the Major League Soccer after 20 years. Trust me, we were all dying inside that it took that long. Um, but it finally has been broken and the doors are being opened. So those who are saying, yes, it brings hard. Is there opportunities for me as a woman um, in the game? I'm going to say, yes, now is the tipping point after many, many years and people in front of even me who trailblaze this path for us. The tipping point has happened. There's opportunity, room and growth on the men's and the women's side, that if you're a great official, we're only looking for quality, regardless of the gender of the competition and regardless of your gender. We're looking for quality. Nobody wants to make a bad decision on the field and we want to get those key match incidents, what we call. So I wanted to kind of show you guys this because it gets me excited and I hope it gets, and I know that it gets others excited in the soccer community. Um, and ideally any of those of you who are looking forward to it. So I'll switch to the next slide. Um, and this one I, I, I kind of really love because I don't think you can see the words for it right now. But effectively, I show you this photo. Oh, if you can go back. Yeah. So basically, it's all starts for the money, right? Um, we're here. It's a career fair. You're learning about jobs in, this, uh, in the sports sector. Um, and honestly, the reason the majority of us start refereeing is for the money. Um, it's not bad money. Uh, I started, like I said, when I was 10 years old um, for two different reasons. One, I was yelling at the referee. And my coach was a referee, and he said I sounded obviously incorrect. I didn't know what I was saying, which respectfully, that happens a lot, even on the professional levels. They don't know the laws of the game, and it's very irritating, but it is what it is. So I was forced and sent to a referee class if I wanted to continue to yell at the referee. So I said, yes, I'll, I, I want to sound educated. I think, uh, I think a lot of us want to be educated if we're saying something. Um, and that kind of took off into effectively uh, for, I would say, between the ages of 10 to 18, 19, I didn't know there was a path or a career to move up to professionals and to international. So I officiated because playing collegiate sports, I was able to effectively have this type of a job where I'm doing something I already love. The fitness is already there, right? You already know the game. It's enjoyable and I'm pocketing money. And I know the rates have increased and it's all dependent upon what you're refereeing. But I mean, for center officials now, I think it's for like the U16, 17s, you can make $75, $80 in the center now, right? Depending upon what tournament and what league. So we're not talking about chump change, right? <laughs> we're talking about money that's meaningful. Even back in the day, that was meaningful for me. As a 10, 11 year old, I was able to buy my first car with my own money and I'm a first generation American. Um, my parents worked really hard to give me a good education and we didn't have money. I didn't grow up in a family of means. So the ability to be able to supply for myself was incredibly meaningful for me when I was in my youth. Um, and there's a, still an opportunity. So we all started grassroots refereeing. Um, and then that's when, like I said, it was around 18, 19, I was playing a collegiate game. Um, I started yelling at the referee, go figure that I learned that there was a path to it when they had called me after the game and said, hey, would you come to these certain tournaments, similar to a player, you get identified um, one way or the other, right? Whether it's at the grassroots, whether it's a national, and you get invited to different tournaments, right? So if we talk about youth, right? You go to state cup, right? Tournament, and you get selected from your state cup and you go to your regional tournament, right? Here, I'm from Florida, so it's the US Southern Regional. And then from that regional tournament, you get selected to the nationals for youth. There's the same trajectory and path for amateur uh, with U.S. adult soccer amateurs. That's how you get selected and you go through that path. And like I said, same thing as players. We're scouting and we're looking for that it factor, for that individual who can kind of climb to the tops, who has that confidence level and or, more importantly, the potential to do so. Um, 
And it's not a one and done thing. Um, refereeing similar to like players, we all have our different seasons. Um, we may all be really, really good one season and be off another season. Uh, and then we kind of come from there. So um, why I emphasize this is many of you guys have played the game. Many of you guys are athletes. Uh, what specifically we are looking for in the refereeing component um, at all different levels, um, U.S. soccer, pro, FIFA, NCAA, is we are looking for athletes on the field. Um, what we do is not physically easy. I think if I could pick my sport again to officiate, it definitely would be something more towards uh, maybe tennis um, or volleyball because <laughs> my knees and my multiple ACLs is not holding up really well in my early 30s. Um, though we are looking for athletes. Um, this is still the ability, which is ironic, because um, we always perform against each other to get selected uh, and appointed to different matches, but we're still a team in everything we do, right? Um, as I mentioned, this isn't my full-time job. It's starting to become a full-time job for some of my friends like Tori Penso um, because of the time commitment they have to put into it. But it's something that you can do on the side while you grow into your sports career. So, for example, I will just train between 5.30 to 7.30 in the morning, um, whether it's an hour or two-hour training. That's where I put in my trainings before my workday starts. And I do have a little five-year-old who I love to pieces, and she's awesome. Um, so I'm able to effectively counterbalance at times when I need to be extreme, whether it's in my referee world, whether it's in my legal world, whether it's in my family life. But ultimately, if you have that base, there is the ability to train with others, there's ability to connect, and there's ability to get to, get to that elite level. There's nothing, 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 nothing that I can say at this moment aside from being a player that replaces walking out of that pitch with both teams behind you, with the ESPN camera or any of those big broadcast cameras focused on you while you're picking up the ball, you hear the adrenaline, um, you see the players. I always joke um, because I've been part of some of the biggest sporting events um, as the official on that pitch, right? Abby Wambach uh, exceeding me a hand, right? I'm on that game. I'm the one who has to effectively get the ball, right? So we don't lose the ball, right? I'm sitting there while they're all celebrating, you know, Heather Riley's retirement game. I'm the center official of that match, right? Andrea Huckel's her retirement game was my first international game. Um, it's just really, really cool perspective to be able to be part of the history of sports, especially soccer here, and to have this kind of background view where we are probably some of the bigger supporters, but obviously we can't say anything. <laughs> but we are, have that ability to see the growth and particularly what has made me really excited um, that I hope makes many of you guys excited if you want to come down this path of refereeing is the growth of the National Women's Soccer League as well and where it's come from. I officiated um, from the beginning in the Women's Professional Soccer and WPS. Um, and to have been able to see the growth and unfortunately, you know, the pros and the cons from both of the leagues between NWSL and WPS, it's just incredible. And I know Lisa was on here recently. It's just incredible to see not only the, 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 the league grow, but the team specifically grow like Sky Blue, uh, who is now obviously Gotham, which is going to take me a bit. But it's just there's such an opportunity and path that I'm really excited to be able to share with, with you guys, answer any questions that you may only. I think we lost Christina for a second, but she's popping back in now. As Here we go. Perfect. Perfect. So I don't know where I lost you all at, but um, my whole point of being was just I'm really excited to be here and really educate any of those who have questions about the power and the opportunities, um, the number of teams that are growing in all the different leagues, and there is so much potential. We need to build our bench, what I think is our referee bench, of quality officials um, to be able to service the game that we all love. And I know my time's coming up here shortly, so any questions you have from either my path or how refereeing effectively works, I am more than happy to effectively answer any of those for you all. So um, let's see here. Yeah, let me see if I can help you out. There were lots of questions that came in from the previous panel as well that we weren't able to jump into. but. Uh, Alex Bastone's recent message of how do you handle the criticism? I'm sure your job can be thankless at times. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I think that's kind of the, the power of many of us who do, who are in soccer and sports is 
having the ability to, I call it effectively, um, you know, have a different kind of mindset, right? So when I put on the jersey, um, I know that if someone's yelling, they're not yelling at me as a person, so I'm compartmentalizing that. They're yelling at the uniform itself, right? Uh, it's unfortunate, but any sport outside of soccer, right, everyone just wants to yell and blame things on the referee all the time, and that is part of the territory. However, my ability to compartmentalize, I know it's not a personal thing. So now that I do a lot of broadcasting work um, as well as writing work, and it is even funny to see on Monday uh, officiating Santa Clara versus FSU to look up into the crowd and I'm like, who are the loudest people out there? And obviously it was Allie and Leslie um, uh, and, and co out there. Those are the people I work with nowadays. And I know when I first started working with them, they're like, I'm not allowed to talk to you. You're the referee. And I'm like, no, 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 we're a human being. <laughs> we have personalities. We're humans as well. So um, that's how we handle the criticism really is you have to have a mentality of being able to take the information eliminate the majority of it because it's just people venting to make themselves feel a little bit better, honestly. And then to take, if anything, that can help us grow and become better referees. Because like I saw on Jerry Smith, like none of us want to step on the pitch and make a key match incident and mistake on the match. We're on that game to be 100%, as close to 100% as an official as we possibly can. So a lot of compartmentalizing and focusing on the mindset, truly, a lot of meditation. Ah, oh, that's a perfect segue, Christina. I want to say thank you so much for hopping on here and for giving us all of this. We are going to take these last couple minutes to transition over. But first, Christina, thank you so much. Are we able to, if we're able to share this content, let us know if there's any way you want us to get in touch with you. We shared Christina's Twitter handle in the chat, but please let us know how the best way to uh, to follow your journey. Yeah, so um, social media would probably be the best way. And I also gave my email address in case you are interested. Um, I have no issues connecting you with the person in your state or whatnot. Um, big proponent of it, especially more women officials in the game. I think we have a little bit more of a skill set to be able to uh, manage players a lot better, in my opinion. <laughs> I might agree uh, from my own personal experience. With Christina, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Folks, now is that time to get ready to connect. And as Christina so wonderfully shared, uh, hey, Laura, Laura Schatz getting in early. She's going to be at the coaching table that will be on floor two. You can find her there. Laura's coming to us from the Portland Thorn Academy. So definitely get some time to chat with her. But alongside Laura, there will be several other folks on the, on the floor. Just give you a quick heads up. We have Sarah Rosenblum joining us from Brooklyn City Football Club at the Youth Club Management Table. We'll have Mina Stempel from found, uh, the founder of First Harmony uh, talking about mindfulness, as Christina just alluded to, how valuable that is as, we, as professionals on the field and off the field. What are the tips and tools and techniques you can grab for the rest of this Mental Wellness Awareness Month that we are in, which is May? We'll also have one more session with uh, Maria Grasso at the Sponsorship Partnership Table on Floor 1. You'll see Meg Sullivan at the Finance Table on Floor 1 from the NWSL. And as always, you will have Samantha at the USL Table as well as Brittany at the Football Leases Table. Go, you have 20 minutes, hang out, have a great time, and we will see you back up here for the mentorship panel in, in, just, a, in just a bit. Laura, head over to the coaching table. Bye, all. Welcome, Candice and Zakia and Cassie are popping up on stage. They are all ready for our next panel. Yes, Tiffany is getting in here and we will have our moderator, Yawande Balagoon, joining us in just a second. She is the assistant head coach at UC Davis alongside Tracy Ham, who we got to hang out with earlier. For those that are just joining us, welcome. We are diving into our third panel the business of mentorship from the perspective of coaches and leaders and grassroots uh, grassroots leaders as well. So get ready for that. Once we have you, Wande, up here, she will take it away. I'm thrilled to hear people are enjoying the networking segments. We will have one more, uh, two more of those, 130 and 245. Uh, get ready to hop over to our next segment following this panel. We'll be moving into part three where we'll have some more workshops and panels as well. But so far, I mean, Candice and Cassie and Zakia and Tiffany, I don't know if you just, you're just joining us, but it has been an inspiring and empowering morning. Last session, we heard from Christina Uncle, 
one of the on on how do I get into refereeing and the insights and the takeaways. Man, you all are inspiring me day in and day out. I'm so lucky to to be able to be here. But Tori Penso is the first center ref in an MLS game last year. We're making our way up the ladder. And takeaways that also really resonated with me is money matters. And with your team around you, you can make it to the elite level. So I'm I'm really excited to get some more golden nuggets from all of you in the realm of mentorship. In the meantime, some exciting things to look forward to later today. We're going to have Paige Monahan from Gotham FC joining us at the professional playing table at 1.30. So get ready to pop over there on floor two and hang out with her. And later on, it'll be Samantha Johnson, one of our founding members and a defender over at Melbourne City, but she played at Utah and you know, she's been all around. So that'll be some fun conversations to snag if you're if you're interested in professional playing as a career, you could be, uh, or if you're just looking for, if you're just looking for uh, some some fun tidbits of what happens behind the scenes. Um, Everett asking me about my pin. Yes, pin change. So I've been doing pin changes this morning. I started with my allyship pin, and then I went to my Gotham SD pin because we had a lease with you with us. We have the sustainable development goal pin. And I put this on because one, I got it from our partners and who had, were very much so mentors of ours in the very beginning of Courtney launching this and us figuring out what we were doing um, from uh, Beyond Sport. Those folks over at Beyond Sport keeping us going. So I got that from one of their events. But I also I also wear it with excitement because this game is such a global game and has the power to do a lot on and off the field as we have been learning. We, what we'll do while we're getting you one day up here, let's just jump in with some introductions. Why don't we kick off with Zakia? Why don't you uh, jump in and give us a little bit of background into, into you and where you're joining us from? Good day, everyone. So happy to be here with everyone. I'm Zakia Brown. I'm the high school program director for America Scores New York. Um, I just recently opened a juice bar cafe in the Bronx as well. So I'm a newly found business owner and I have a fashion and lifestyle brand. I'm so happy to be here um, and hear from the rest of you. We're so excited that you can be here with us. As everyone knows, we love scores. All right, let's 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 keep it moving along. Candice, a little bit. And I, I remember we also, Tiffany, when we were chatting beforehand, we talked about how mentorship has been relevant in each of your lives. You can also give a little bit of insight your interest like in Zakia we can come back and make sure we get that from you too if you'd like. I was gonna say do we want to like throw it back that way and, and so that way she can talk if she wants I'm good if you want to go there first or good. All right so just the power of mentorship in general I think is so important in this role as a coach for America Scores starting out I started to learn how important mentorship was if the consistency is there being authentic and just having at least one reoccurring adult in your life that's always gonna show up, I think is super important. And just identifying that a mentor sometimes is not someone that has a cape on, um, it, it looks different. And I think that as you get older, you start to realize that. So I think it's just important for people like us to be in the youth life, to let them know like, hey, mentorship starts from ground level. So it's super important. I couldn't agree more and that's, a hard follow-up, but yeah, I'm Candace Fabry, the founder of Fearless and Capable, a mentorship program for uh, coaches, referees, and administrators, um, really particularly looking at the youth level um, to try to support more women uh, to enter and uh, retain and then honestly lead. Um, that's my goal is to provide that support. Uh, looking at women that are just getting started in their coaching career, whether that's 18, 19, or even 40, 45, coming back into the game and hopefully um, trying to find some support while they do it. So uh, I, I am out of Kansas City. I am a coach and a coaching education uh, instructor, and I happen to be a mom of two kids, uh, one that likes soccer and one that could care less about soccer, but it's all good. Um, support them with whatever they want. So yeah, and mentorship to me has been uh, extremely valuable. It's been pretty male dominated, but men are fantastic mentors and allies. They are out there and can be really great. Um, and 
for being a um, survivor of sexual assault from a head coach that I, um, you know, had and trusted. Uh, male mentors were the ones that came right alongside me, grabbed my arm and said, you can do this and you can coach and you will be fantastic. Um, and so that really meant a lot. And for me, I don't know if I would be in the game without uh, these mentors. And so I know from firsthand what it can do to empower you when you are at a real low moment of self-doubt and uh, when the passion seems to have drained and they can be there to help reinstill it because they see it in you. They see it in themselves a lot of times. And so it's been an important journey for me. And it's something that I want to do for so many more women um, to help them stay in the game through the good and the bad. So. We didn't really have a next person, so should, you, should I just like kick it over? How about Tiff? Uh, uh, thank you, Candice. Also, sorry for the technical difficulties, you all. Um, happy to be in now. Um, I'm Yawande Balagoon. Um, I heard Rachel give a short intro, um, but yes, assistant coach at UC Davis and founding expert member here at WIS. So thank you all for being here. Um, let's go ahead and keep these intros going so we can keep them moving. Um, so Cassie, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Cassie Gray. I'm the founder and director of an organization called Female Footballers, and we provide mental skills training for female athletes in a mentorship environment. Um, my own mentorship journey, um, I had a lot of ma male coaches as well, like Candice, and had great experiences with them. They're definitely allies. But when I played at UC Berkeley, I actually played with Tracy Ham and um, she was my, my, she's younger than me. I'm older, <laughs> but, um, she, uh, when we were both at Cal, our assistant coach, a lady named Jennifer Thomas was probably a really pivotal person in my life who became a, a mentor for me. And a lot of the things that she did with our team and the impact that she had, uh, made me want to become a mentor for girls, um, in the same way. And so that's a lot of what I do at female footballers. And, um, I'm based in the Bay area in San Jose. California, and I'm just excited to be here. Thank you guys so much, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. All right, I am Tiffany Fraser. I'm out here in Sacramento, uh, California, so not far from you, Cassie. I'm originally from the Bay Area, though, um, and I'm holding dearly to my 408 uh, phone number as well. Um, but I'm excited to be here. I am the Chief of Staff with Street Soccer USA. And for us, you know, coaching and mentorship go hand in hand. Um, it's, uh, you know, something that we talk about and think about every second we're on the field and, and off the field and really trying to help our players um, really identify those things in themselves that will help them uh, to see themselves as a mentor and to see themselves as someone who has, you know, value and something to give back. And so I'm excited to talk about this topic and certainly wouldn't be here without the mentors I've had in my life. Thank you all for those lovely intros. Um, jump right into you know, our questions. We wanna talk about obviously mentorship today, um, but on the personal side as well as you know, what that can look like on the, on the business side. Um, so let's start with Candice. Um, so a lot of times in, in the mentor-mentee relationship, a lot of focus is put on to mentor. How can mentees be proactive in you know, the mentorship process? Like what kind of questions should they be asking or what should they be looking for in a mentor? That's great. We just little snapshot discussion of that at the table. So uh, that that flowed nicely into this this question. And you know, the one thing that I, I really stress with mentees is there's a, a lot of great mentors out there that want to help you um, and are willing to sit down and talk. But you kind of got to know yourself. You kind of got to know where you want to go. You've got to you know, look at, I'm, I'm a big advocate of personal core values. If you've got a set of values that are your North Star that are leading you in a direction that helps you know, guide your decision making and the treatment of not just everybody else, but also yourself. And so when you can start to really know what you want and how you want to live, um, both within your prefer, uh, profession, within your career, um, start asking those questions of yourself first. What do I want? So then now when you find these mentors, um, you're really going to start to be able to bring out what specific things you're looking for 
out of their knowledge bank because their knowledge bank is huge and they can go on and on and on. Um, but I'm a huge advocate that the mentor lives with, lives in the space between your self-reflection and your decision. We're just in that space to help guide and give thoughts and give opinions, but it's ultimately up to you. So when you look back and you can think about what you want, what support networks do you have? What support networks do you want? What motivates you? You know, what things get you going and saying, I want to tackle that? What are your challenges or limitations? What are your strengths? And so if you can really take that self-reflection piece and then dive into the conversation with a mentor and find a mentor that is going to give you specific insights that help you make the decision. Because again, she's not making it, you are. And so when you can come with specific questions about their experiences or about their opinions on the field, or what things do we not know and, and being as specific as possible, I think you get the most out of it. And, and the final thing is, is, as we said before, and I can't remember right now, they don't wear capes. They don't have to be in your profession and they don't have to be this absolute idol. I mean, I'd love Jill Ellis to be my mentor if she's out there, but it, I mean, the reality is she's not going to be it for me. So can these mentors, and, and when you look at that broad scope of that term, start to find people in these little spaces that actually, you know, seem to fit your level of support or your way to be motivated and they can come in and maybe it's just being a better communicator, you know, writing better emails, being clear and concise in your email writing. Maybe you need that. Maybe as a coach, you need to talk to a teacher. Talk to a teacher who's managing a classroom all day and how do they have little tactics to make themselves better? So they're not always the one we, we put on the pedestal and get to look at and idolize. Um, they do fantastic work, but there's really great women in particular that are around that can give fantastic advice if you're ready to come with some things that you know about yourself and some things you wanna know more about yourself in that career field. Um, Candice, thank you. Um, I, don't know, I was over here taking notes myself. Um, on that. So I'm actually going to switch up the order because I kind of want to do the flip side here. So um, Zakia, um, just to kind of do the opposite there, like what advice might you have for someone in a position to be a mentor and how they can make the relationship more mutually beneficial? Thank you for that. Candice, you, you killed them with that response. And I think it is about knowing yourself, right? Because when you are going to be in this position to mentor someone, I think you have to have that confidence and you do have to know yourself. But I think it's important to also set some goals. So right now I'm running the Coaching for Change Power by Nike Academy. And it's a mentorship program as well. And I was able to bring in 20 youth. So I think that me, I had to find intentionality behind what is this mentorship relationship going to be like for these youth coaches. So I had to do a lot of quiet and read the room, right? Because I felt like when I first started with America's was and I was running a league, I was like, we're family and hugging. And they were like, no, no, no. And then I had to read the room. So whether it was tapping into their zone, I am a kid from the Bronx. So my day-to-day -day was their day-to-day -day as well. So I definitely relate to them in that aspect. But I think it's finding the baseline of relatability to be authentic. And sometimes that relationship, right? You might not see your mentor every day. You don't speak to them every day, but whatever that system is that you do have, but I speak to you twice a month. I now have America Score started a new mentorship program with our board. And my mentor, Ms. Price, she's amazing. I actually saw her yesterday and she came to my shop. And she, sometimes we don't have goals, and but I can shoot the stuff on Zoom and I feel amazing and she gives me that space. And I didn't even know that I just needed that mentor and I'm 34 years old at this point in my life. So I think it's about being authentic, being consistent, being relatable. You have to be relatable. And, and, and that makes you question yourself as a mentor, right? How, where do I meet this person? How do I meet them at, in the middle? And if you're in that mentor position, you wanna meet that person in the middle, right? I wanna have some common ground with you. So I think that it's gonna look different for everybody. There may not be a blueprint structure of how to be a mentor, you know, but you create those special relationships, whether you're coaching students and give, and for me it's students, right? But um, proper email etiquette or how to conduct yourself on Zoom or just how to follow up and use your Google Calendar. Like I keep telling, I'm equipping you with all the tools. I'm like, somebody used to tell me that and I didn't understand it. So I think if you're authentic, you're relatable and you're consistent, you can't fail with that.
authentic, relatable, and consistent. Write that down, everyone. Um, thank you for that, Zakiya. <laughs> um, these, you guys are killing it with these responses, so thank you for this. Um, I'm gonna jump over to Cassie. Um, so what are some key tips that you have, um, you know, towards making a mentorship, you know, impactful and like what systems might you put in place to make sure that it's a safe space um, and everyone stays conscientious about being in, in the relationship? Yeah, for sure. So I think Candace hit one thing that was huge, which was um, they don't have to wear, or as the key is that they don't have to wear capes, but again, they don't have to be, um, mentors don't have to be, you know, the end all be all, the Alice is like you mentioned, and I think, um, first of all, providing mentors in a grassroots environment, which is what I do, is hugely important. And I think that um, we just need access to these types of people. And that finding that access can be hard, but it is out there. Um, and it's really important that we, we seek it out as mentees and as mentors that we are trying to provide it. And there's so many organizations that provide it. And I think when you look at a mentorship program and how we can be impactful, it needs a few things. And the first one, I think, um, both Candace and Zakia mentioned that education piece, the relatable piece and the education piece are the two probably most important. Um, in my day job, I'm, I've taught uh, elementary school for 13 years, so I am also a, an educator um, part time now. But um, that education piece, not only for your mentors, but also your mentees. So what that looks like uh, would be mentors need to be educated on not only the content that you're providing as an organization, um, but also the cognitive, the social, emotional stages and the needs of the mentees. So that's that relatable piece that Zakia was mentioning. You have to be able to relate to, to kids or teens and you or women or men, whoever you're mentoring. Um, but also you, you need to make sure you know your content. So at Female Footballers, we have regular professional development meetings with just our mentors. We onboard them with the content that we're providing. We have courses, monthly courses that we kind of unveil, but they're all open at all times. But we need to make sure our mentors, first and foremost, know the content of that uh, mental skill. For example, in our organization, we provide these mental skill courses. So um, we onboard them with the content, but then we also have to have separate meetings where we're having um, onboarding of just the social emotional needs at that time because life is changing and this past year has shown us that the needs of these people that we're mentoring are mentoring are going to change and so a lot of this past year for our organization was pivoting and and um, for example our courses uh, you take a course and you're then paired with um, a mentor and the mentor is often a professional soccer player um, and these girls are not the U.S. women's national team players a lot of them play internationally um, some in Spain, some in France, some of them are beach soccer player, pro players, um, trying to show them there's different pathways and different avenues to get these mentors. But um, we learned early on that our mentors, um, you know, everyone had Zoom fatigue and that was kind of how we were connecting. And so we had to pivot and offer different ways to connect. So we have uh, video messaging now so that they can leave a video message if they don't want to Zoom. We have email, we have phone calls. So you have to provide a lot of avenues um, as well. So making it impactful is pivoting, it's providing education. And again, it's that relatable piece is, is huge. So just knowing, um, knowing who you're working with. And so some of that development piece of, I know for my organization, it's girls and we start as young as 10. Um, and so knowing the ages that you're working with is really important. I hope that answered that. <laughs> it a hundred percent did. Um, I think that was a great answer. Um, and I think a great segue into our next question also you talked about, you know, mentoring, you know, young women at, at the grassroots level or, you know, and, um, Tiffany have a little bit to do with that as well. Um, so really you're mentoring the next generation of, of mentors, right? So Tiff, can you talk to us about, you know, how you empower your young mentees to be mentors? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, you know, the thing we see a lot with the communities that we work with is just the concept of mentorship is is so foreign to a lot of the kids that we work with and frankly, a lot of the adults we work with. So with Street Stock USA, we're, we're really aiming to introduce life skills to a lot of folks through the game, right? And so we're looking to find those moments or those skills when they're demonstrated and really highlight and point them out and help folks to identify those in themselves and identify those 
um, you know, skills that, that are standout and that are really helping them to grow and develop and pointing them out, calling them out, talking them through it, and then really looking for those opportunities where they can show that to someone else. And so, you know, they don't quite know that that's mentorship that's happening when we say, you know, remember that last time when this play happened and this is what you did? Like, look, and now we see that other girl doing the same thing. Why don't you tell her what you did and how you worked through that? And so it starts with those little moments that we can highlight and kind of point out that may just be skills and again, may just be instances, but then they're seeing themselves teach someone else something. And now that becomes a really empowering uh, exchange. And then as that continues to happen, we, we get a position folks in different leadership roles or, you know, captain of this practice or that, you know, effort or endeavor, even if it's just walking them across the street back to, you know, the neighborhoods that they live in, but finding them those places where that they can be leaders and start to see themselves as such. Um, and I think, you know, that's really how we've seen mentorship be able to develop or just that, that thought that, you know, not only can I learn something from you, but I can go teach something to someone else. Um, and it's really cool because we get to see that in, you know, our little kids, but we often are working with adults that are transitioning out of homelessness or addiction or domestic violence and these situations where maybe they've lost self-worth or just an understanding of their value. And through the game and through these moments, we get to help identify those um, and then create moments where they get to see themselves a little bit differently too. Thank you, Tiffany. I think that's so awesome. Um, and again, you know, with the with the younger girls who have those opportunities to be mentored and you know start to see themselves um, as mentors going forward, and you know turn into women like yourselves who decide to start mentoring programs. Um, you know, so that that leads us into the, the next bit about the business side of it, right? Um, so. Cassie, female footballers. <laughs> um, can you just give us a little bit of insight on how to begin and sustain a mentorship program? Yeah, for sure. So um, the first thing that we did at Female Footballers is we had, we we picked a director. Um, our director is Haley Lucas. She's a professional player in France um, at the moment. Um, and what she started to do, we created a handbook for our mentors, of uh, the social norms in our organization, the content that we want to hit. Um, and then we, you know, like I said, we have these mentor meetings where we meet weekly and we discuss um, not only the content, but what's going on in the world of soccer and girls in general. And we discuss sort of um, how to relate. And we also get to know our mentors really well on a basis of, you know, who do you like to work with? What ages work for you? What topics do you feel strongly about? So that we can, when we have a mentee who comes on board, and we vet them as well. We have um, profile pages that we ask content about them, you know, whether they're an introvert, extrovert, um, you know, how they kind of view themselves, um, making sure that we learn as much as we can about them before we start working with them so that we can pair them with the right person. Um, and we have certain mentors that we know enjoy working with younger players and some with olders, um, the different levels in the sport we kind of work with as well. Um, so we look at everyone's kind of strengths and weaknesses, and we try to pair them up accordingly. Um, but like I mentioned, that professional development piece, that education piece is huge because life is always changing. And so our, our mentors really need to be up to date with what's going on in the world of youth soccer, since we're working with girls 10 and up. Um, and we, you know, as you know, I'm older. And so the, the landscape of what that looked like when I played is so different from what it looks like nowadays. But what we all connect on is that these mental skills that girls are um, going through at all these different stages, we can relate to. So we really play off on those relatable pieces and the connections that um, we found in all of our mentors, you know, they came on board because they felt very passionately that there wasn't something like this for them when they were young and they wanna give back. And so the giving back piece is really, really big. Uh, we don't seek out people to be mentors if that's not something they're passionate about because we're not gonna get, um, that connection isn't gonna be strong with our mentor-mentee relationships unless there's buy-in from both sides. Um, and so that's a really big piece. But I think sustaining mentorship programs, just you have to bring value to both the mentors, the mentees, and show them that we care and that the growth and development of both sides is, is equally important, so. 
very insightful. Thank you, Cassie. Um, Candice, Cassie talked to us a little bit about her um, process for um, vetting mentors, but can you go a little bit more in depth with that about how you do that at Fearless and Capable? Yeah, we uh, not too not too different as we kind of mentioned. You know, you're you have a profile that these mentors are completing, and that's followed up by an interview. And you know, as someone running a a program that I really want, you know, I saw a question in the Q and A. How do I how do I get a mentor if I'm not in soccer right now or connected to one? Well, what I've tried to aim is that. It's not about you being in right now or where you're at. We're here for you when you're ready to come into the game and when you're ready to have that career. And so these mentors, I'm looking for a variety of types of personalities. And, you know, similar in those profiles, we're looking for extrovert, introvert. We're looking for how do you think you best give information? You know, are you a straight shooter? Um, you know, what are some of the things you want? to get better at as a mentor? What are things that you're actually looking for um, in this process of mentoring? And I think there's a ton of development of leadership skills and emotional intelligence that comes with the mentors that get involved with Fearless and Capable. And, you know, similar, we have orientations and trainings. There's um, a, you know, one of our more recent coming up trainings for our mentors are going to be about being trauma informed. I mean, we're inviting women um, into this, into the space and into this vulnerable, um, you know, safe community to say, we want to help you go forward. But sometimes that reflection might take a look back at some things that weren't so positive. And so helping our mentors feel like they are, one, ready to take in information, and then, two, finding ways that they're then comfortable as mentors reaching out to their mentors or reaching out to the network. So, for you know, the trauma-informed, for instance, we're going to make sure they know the law enforcement, the risk management, um, you know, lawyers. All of those resources are available to them because as mentors, you know, making sure that you, just as we've all touched on, ours is equipped and understood about where you're at in your environment and how you can help, which also means knowing that you can't be the specific one to help. And so we vet mentors that are going to be accountable to the process, accountable to the responsibility they have to the mentee. Um, and so one of those things through the whole, um, you know, interview process and so on is knowing that you're going to have a mentorship agreement with this mentee. And that comes with desired outcomes that are going to be mutually agreed upon. Um, and so your commitment to just filling out that agreement and then working to fulfill it to every way possible, um, you know, route you have to go to help the mentee achieve it. Um, that's a huge thing. And to work with a personality that maybe is a little uncertain. And so, yeah, we, we that personality check is something that I know I have to say, well, this is how I mentor because it works for my personality. But that's not going to work for everybody. And I want to have this really well-rounded um, group of women that are there for a well-rounded group of women that want to work in it. Um, and then the other touch point that I have is that Fearless and Capable is really focused on um, embracing all the identities you have. Um, so as I said at the beginning, I'm a coach, I'm a mom, I'm an educator, um, I'm now an entrepreneur, and I, whatever, blah, goes on. Um, and I'm awesome and I'm proud of that. And I don't feel like I have to be siloed in this space. I can, you know, provide value in all these pivots and shifts and little take ons I've had. And we have so many women that, you know, nobody's open to juice bar. I think that's awesome. I'm excited to get to the Bronx and visit the juice bar. Um, but I think, you know, those multiple sides, those multiple hats we all wear, that's so much value as a mentor. That provides so much for these women that are either starting their career or re entering it or, hoping to re-enter it to go back to the Q&A um, that, you know, I really want women that are invested representative of the people that are looking for opportunities to get guidance. Um, and that's that's one of the big key ways that we do that is, is that real holistic view of what you're doing and how you want to impact um, and then create the support mechanisms to get you to be a better mentor and get better yourself. I think that's a huge piece, so. Awesome, thank you, Candice. Uh little bit of a shift. Um, Tiffany, how can you be strategic in choosing mentors specifically for your business or your brand if you have an idea of the direction that you want to go in? Yeah, I love what Candice was just saying about uh, just the holistic kind of approach and not, you know, not pretending that you're you're not wearing 50 million hats. And I think that's uh, something that, you know, I've really come to appreciate in 
think about differently as I've gotten older. When I first started um, thinking about mentorship and, and looking for mentors in my mid 20s, I think I, I was more so focused on, okay, you know, someone in a similar career path or with the job I want to have and, and thinking about it solely like that. And, um, you know, what I've learned from mentors is really just how important it is to consider the, the whole person and consider, you know, how they're navigating through life. What is their lifestyle like? And, you know, look for also those things that you really admire and respect about someone. And a lot of times I've found um, that when I think of it that way and I think about man, I love that this person has this balance with their career and their life and they still play soccer every day and they enjoy it. And, you know, when I think about it in more of a holistic way, it's allowed me to, I think, be more thoughtful and strategic about the mentors that I'm, I'm seeking out. Um, and the important piece, I had one mentor really kind of sit and, and talk me through thinking about how, you know, how other people kind of talk about your mentors or how, people are are understanding you know how these folks kind of walk through life as a whole you know and and how they walk in a room how people respond to them and and think of it that way and start to you know dissect like why are people responding to this person that way and so really thinking a little bit harder about you know those qualities and and components that are making someone that you look up to uh that are making them admirable and and that really helped me to kind of be strategic and just more considerate of the mentors I was choosing rather than saying, hey, this person is a CEO of X, Y, and Z, and that's what I want to be. And so I'm going to naturally go to that person, right? Instead, really thinking about it in this holistic way, I think allows you to, to make sure that you're also being authentic as well about, um, you know, the mentors you're choosing and kind of the, the path forward for yourself. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, want to get over uh, to ask Zakia a question as well. Um, you had mentioned earlier, Zakia, about um, some of your partnerships, like with Nike, um, and I imagine the vetting process is probably pretty similar to you know individual mentorship. But um, just in terms of maybe even like resources, like what might be the implementation process, and you know how might you keep it practical? I think for America Scores as a whole. Uh, we just recently restructured our mission statement, right? So seeking, seeking to create equitable opportunities using our social justice youth development framework. I think it's so important, right? For um, organizations that want to partner with us, whether you're a community-based organization or a large funder or a company, I think our initial, initial baseline of our mission statement and what we stand for is so important. Um, I think creating racial equity spaces for people and our poor athletes, I think is so important. But um, I think Nike sees things like that and they see the work that we do, how we carry the student from kindergarten to eighth grade and with alumni program like Saturday Night Lights, like our Kicking It Forward League, um, they see the investment that we have with these students and the trajectory and I think that that's important. The relationships that we have with the district attorney's office and Saturday Night Lights and the NYPD, I think that that is a relationship that taught me that it has to be authentic in order for it to work. Um, I created a youth council um, and a lot of those students are from Washington Heights. So at the height of the pandemic and George Floyd and with the riots, student, students had a lot to say about that. And they, you know, they brought up their relationship with law enforcement and how they want it to be authentic how they want to build more. They were interested in doing a street fair or having offices. They used to come to our practice. So how do we build on those relationships? So I think that organizations see that with us and they want to partner more with us. And I think we learn about ourselves, right? As we continue to lead this ship, um, I think we realize how important that that is, that our relationships are. I'm able now, this year as a director, to sit in on more meetings and help to foster those relationships. I was working actually in a store with Nike when I was just with America Sports part-time. And I was like, I only want to do community for Nike. If it's not community, I don't want to do anything else. And then we were able to foster this relationship. And now I'm running a Coaching for Change powered by Nike Academy for them. So I think that it's important to me as a Black woman too, sitting in these meetings and making you feel my presence every single time. I don't let up. This is me. I'm going to be this way. And I think that for me in this space, in this organization, that's how 
I've been able to navigate and foster partnerships. Um, we knew we have a new partnership with like Champs at Foot Locker and they donated like 200 sneakers to us. And I was able to do a sneaker giveaway and they're going to activate a space this Saturday with us and kind of gearing these students up to feel confident and get back on the pitch to play. So I think that, again, being authentic, being consistent, being relatable, I think that's how we foster these partnerships um, and get these deals done. Awesome. Thank you, Zakia. Authentic. That is consistent and relatable. I told you guys to write that down. Um, that seems to be the theme here. Um, well, you have to jump off here, so I'm going to give you a chance to, to go ahead and pop off. And we have about three minutes left, so I, I do want to get to one of these Q&As as well. So um, really quickly, before we cut off here, um, one of the Q&As, and I know Candace touched on the question about someone who's not connected to a soccer program. But the other question I have here is, do any of you struggle with imposter syndrome while making decisions that you do at your level and how do you deal with that? And we'll go ahead and answer this and then we can probably close out after that. Cassie, go ahead. I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, I suffer from imposter syndrome big time. <laughs> and I think some people on this that are in the uh, participants know me and they know that about me. Um, what I find is, um, Female footballers in, in my organization and what we're trying to do for young girls, it's it helps me as well. It it's like all these women that have joined as mentors on our program are they've become my mentors. They're who I look to as well. And so, like Zakia said, like it's you know, they're they're not just my colleagues, they're my mentors, and they are people I learn from every single day because they're authentic, because they're relatable. And um and so I just, I find that being around other strong women to lift you up is huge. And that that's what works for me. That's the type of mentor I'm looking for. And that's what I'm providing. But I think that to help me see my value, it's being around others that see my value. Um, but also that when I can see value in others, then it makes you reflect on yourself too. And so it's not, you know, it's, it's just... Um, I just think being around uh, strong, badass women is just super helpful if you're trying to implement these types of programs for younger people, younger than you or kids or whomever it is that you're working with. So That was awesome. I don't, I don't know. What's imposter syndrome? Like you feel like you're not yourself or something? What, what's that? Basically, like you don't you don't feel that you bring enough value to oh, be okay. doing something at that level. So yeah, like you oh, okay. just yeah, can't be you kind of a thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm not perfect out here, but I've never felt like that. And I felt like it really comes from maybe the mentors that I had in my life. Like my grandmother was a Black Panther. So we were raised like she there's no letting up. So we had to be strong. You had to feel confident. I think that this is just has been all part of the process. Everything that I've done thus far before here has led me to this point right here. So I feel like I stand firm on the relationships, on the business that I do in the soccer world and my personal world. Like I'm real. And I feel like that's how you kind of don't lose yourself in this. Now you, it does get hard. Right. And I may work with others or, you know, do business with other people and they may not get it, but I feel like I'm in that space to always, Hey, let's G check it back in. Hey, let's, um, and I and I pray that I stay strong in that to to kind of always keep like tunnel vision in this you know this lane that I'm in to create opportunity for youth, especially in New York City. Like everything that I do outside of this and far, it is to create opportunities for the youth, for the Bronx, for community. So um, stay strong. The only thing I would uh, add or echo is you know getting that back from your mentors and, and constantly checking in with them, I think is something that's helped, you know, me to continue to remember that I have value to add in any moment that, that I arrive in. Um, and also, you know, just being okay with the fact that like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing until I do it. And then I know what I'm doing. Like, you know, it's just, you don't know until you know, and, and then you're there, you know, and, and being okay with that. And so, um, you know, not being so critical on myself, but trusting that I've arrived in this moment because, you know, I have some value to add and I'll, you know, do the best that I can with it. So. Awesome. 
Thank you guys. Um, again, still taking notes because these are some <laughs> great responses. Um, we do have a stop here now. I know Rachel's back in to go ahead and close this out. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Yuwande, Cassie, Tiffany, Zakia, Candice, who is now hopped off. We cannot appreciate you enough. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to stay strong. I'm ready to get reminders. I'm ready to keep charging through. Thank you all so much for the time. Okay, we're a few minutes over. Ariana Christione is waiting for us in part three. I will send us to the floor. I will also put the link in the chat. Click on that link, hop in for part three, and we'll see you there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.